So welcome, friends. Thank you for joining us on another Sabbath School Bible study. Today, we're looking at Longing for God in Zion. That is the title of this week's lesson. And so the subject is Zion. So we're going to study about Zion in the Psalms. And so before we get into our lesson, let's have a quick word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for this time of study. And Lord, we just ask that you please send your Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us through the study. Help us to understand about Zion and help us to understand all of the Psalms. Please help us to understand your message through them and understand this important subject of Zion. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. So our scripture reading mm -hmm. is Psalm 84, verse 2. It says here, My soul longs, yeah, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cries out for the living God. And so here the psalmist, he's super earnest. And he's fervent. And this is what it's about. He's longing for Zion. And at the time, Zion, you could describe it as the, the mountain of God. You call it the uh, place where the sanctuary was. It was also synonymous with Jerusalem too. And so he's longing to be there. He's longing to be in the presence of God. And in that scripture reading, in that memory text, we have um, the, the phrase, the living God, the living God. And that's in contrast with the idols of the pagans, which they were just dumb idols. They were not living. They were dead. And so there's the contrast I want to highlight there. And in our lesson, um, we're focusing on Zion. And Zion is the name of the mountain where uh, Jebus, or Jerusalem, was located, which was also known by the name of Zion. Since David, conquered, since David conquered it, Zion came to be called the city of David. You can read that in 2 Samuel chapter 5, verses 6 through 7. Um, in other places, you see the courts of Zion mentioned, like in Psalm 84, the peace of Zion, Psalm 122, those born in Zion, Psalm 87, and the refuge of Zion, Psalm 46, and the immovable mountain of Zion in Psalm 125. So it appears in uh, different places. Mm -hmm. So you've given us an interesting scoop here on this mm -hmm. Zion. Please pay attention to what Ben mentioned, that the first time Zion is mentioned, is in Second Samuel, you said, chapter Second 5, Samuel, chapter five, verse 6 or 7, six somewhere there, seven. 6 to 7. Mm -hmm. When David conquers mm -hmm. the fortress, the stronghold of Jebusites. Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting that even though the land was conquered after Moses by Joshua, mm -hmm. there's still Jebusites mm -hmm. living in the land. Yeah. So as David begins his kingdom right in the center, mm -hmm. there's this little stronghold. Yeah, like an enclave of Jebusites. By enemies, by mm -hmm. Jebusites, mm -hmm. okay? And that's an interesting perspective. Before we get into Psalms, um, just not even for the sake of trivia, but to understand the context, a lot of Jebusites lived among them and even hold significant positions. Mm -hmm. In the list of nations in Genesis chapter 10, Jebusites are mentioned between Hittites and mm -hmm. Amorites. Mm -hmm. They're kind of among the top three sons of Ham, sons of Canaan, mm -hmm. right? And so when I say Hittites, it should immediately trigger our listeners' attention that David had a general mm -hmm. who was, was a Hittite, a Hittite mm -hmm. and he had a certain wife who was, guess what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but Sheba was a Jebusite. She was mm -hmm. a Hittite, a Jebusite <clears throat> woman. Mm -hmm. And so there's an indication that even Prophet Nathan Mm -hmm. who came to confront David about mm -hmm. Bathsheba, was mm -hmm. actually a Hittite, mm -hmm. a Jebusite. Mm -hmm. So at that time, there was this mix, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. And so this fortress now becomes the fortress of God. And even though it was called Zion before, mm -hmm. now the name applies to the people of God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, we're going to come back to this because um, today the term Zion Mm -hmm. could be offensive, yeah. especially in light with what's happening there in the Middle East and Palestine That's right. yeah. and the whole term of Zionism. Mm -hmm. And we're going to come back to it, I promise. But I want you to understand that in the Bible, the term Zion is not just few occasions here in Psalms. It's mentioned literally 152 times mm -hmm. throughout the Bible. And there's a lot of different occasions when it's mentioned, for instance, prophetic books. Mm -hmm and book of Psalms mm -hmm. are dominant use of this term. Mm -hmm. And 26 out of 152, there's a term daughters of daughters Zion, of yeah. which makes Zion a female. Mm -hmm. And yeah. perhaps a contrast to the other city that is also female, that also has daughters, like which, is, 17. which is yeah. Babylon. Babylon. Mm -hmm. So you have these two cities, Babylon, 
Zion. And so Zion becomes also synonym to Jerusalem. Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. And so that's why it's so important for us to look at this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Longing for God in Zion. Yes. All yeah. right. So with this, you already read the memory yeah, verse, right? Already, yeah. And that takes us to mm -hmm. Psalm 84. And that's an interesting mm -hmm. psalm and also somewhat a challenging psalm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I tell you why. I want to see your take on this. Mm -hmm. It says, better one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And so let's read this psalm. Because the question that is posed in the lesson, who else can be blessed in the sanctuary or by the sanctuary? Mm -hmm. Right? And it's a beautiful question because when you read here, verse 3, even the sparrow mm -hmm. has found a home. Even the swallow a nest for herself. Right? Mm -hmm. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage, and so on. But as I reflect on this, now, Mount Zion is south of Mount Moriah. Okay. The temple is built on Mount Moriah. Mm -hmm. It's the king's palace that is south below mm -hmm. and is on Mount Zion. Mm -hmm. So they had to go north and go up right, to Zion. Right. Mm -hmm. And then go even more up mm -hmm. to the ultimate, to a temple. Yeah. But if you're there, is it really safe? Mm -hmm. With all the animals being killed every day, with all the gore. I mean, mm -hmm. just imagine for a moment the smell yeah. and the sounds. Every day they had to bring the sacrifices there. It wouldn't be like a really nice place to live with all that death and noises. <laughs> so we have to understand that there's a symbolism in there. Mm -hmm. And and I like how he brings even the birds because the term mm -hmm. sanctuary, whenever I teach on, on, on sanctuary, I bring to people's attention that the word sanctuary means a safe place. Mm -hmm. They say birds sanctuary, fish sanctuary, wildlife sanctuary. Yeah. And so when you look at this psalm, there's this concept that this really about the presence of God, mm -hmm. about returning back to the original design when it was safe in the presence of God. Mm -hmm. And that's the beauty of this Psalm 84. So when David mm -hmm. is saying, better one day in your courts, mm -hmm. he's literally saying, God, I want to be in your presence. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And he looks at like being in the presence of God is like coming to your home, like where you're supposed to abide and stay. Like as a swallow finds her nest and, mm. uh, you know, sparrow, same thing. Um, verse 10 has an interesting imagery. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God mm -hmm. than dwell in the tents of wickedness. And doorkeeper, it seems to be such a menial, low job. <laughs> mm -hmm. Doorkeeper. Well, I don't find it. A, well, I, like I said, I used to be, you know, a deacon back, well, years mm -hmm. ago. And... I found that when I kept the door and I welcomed people in, I thought it was a place of blessing for me. I liked it. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, there's there's different ways and different views you can take it as a doorkeeper. But mm -hmm. if we take it back to our lesson and the context of it, well, it'd be pretty cool to be a doorkeeper at the temple to my personally. Mm -hmm. Like you're keeping the temple doors and you're there and you're greeting people coming in who are bringing perhaps their sacrifice and their hearts, um, you know, willing and open to worship. Um, I can imagine just being in that religious environment, how actually much of a blessing that would be. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, this term of being a doorkeeper in the house mm -hmm. of God brings another story to my mind. Mm -hmm. In First Chronicles chapter 15 and 16, there's a particular person, Obed-Edom, yeah. who's a doorkeeper. Mm -hmm. And he's mentioned there chapter 15 verses 24 and 25, right? Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about this Obed-Edom, Chapter 16 mentions him in verse 38. And Obed-Edom, mm -hmm. with his 68 brethren, including Obed-Edom, the son of Jeduthun, and so on, are the gatekeepers. Yeah. The cool thing is, it was in his house that the ark was stored. Yeah. Remember the story when mm -hmm. the ark yeah. is carried and Ozab being struck, and they're mm -hmm. like, where do we put the ark now? So, yeah, so they put it here's there. a guy. He's not <laughs> one of us. He's actually Edomite. So... Let's put the ark there. Yeah, so. And he's being blessed so much that when David, mm -hmm. in 2 Samuel chapter 6, you read the story, comes mm -hmm. to take the ark, mm -hmm. Obed-Edom's like, if you're taking the ark, I'm going with the ark. Yeah. I would rather be a doorkeeper. I would mm -hmm. sweep the floors. I would do whatever it is. But I want to be besides this ark because there's a blessing mm -hmm. with the ark. Yeah. 
And, and it's an interesting perspective. Mm -hmm. And so when we read this Psalm 84, verse 10, it brings to my remembrance this story of mm -hmm. Obed-Edom, the doorkeeper. Yeah. And I would say that should be encouragement to, to deacons, to greeters. Uh, we should never look at a serving opportunity mm -hmm. as kind of demeaning. Mm -hmm. It's a privilege to be in the house of the Lord mm -hmm. in whatever capacity it is because you're not serving mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. You're serving God. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. That's the excitement yeah. of this psalm for me. Yeah, yeah. And not even just serving God, but you're also serving people, which is also a blessing. Um, just think of it. I just want to make a, a point about service. Is that as you're serving as a deacon, you're sort of, and especially as you know, we call a doorkeeper, you're that first point of contact with an individual. And so that could be a new friend you just made that's come in. And don't we want to make new friends? I mean, come on. And so, in essence, you're actually our evangelist. Evangelist, that's it, yeah. Because your loving kindness at the door mm -hmm. goes a long way. Before they meet anybody in church, yeah. they meet the doorkeepers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, really Important. And so, it's this Psalm 84 speaks about the blessedness mm -hmm. of dwelling in the house of God. Mm -hmm. So, moving on to Monday, mm -hmm. pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And this appeal comes from Psalm 122. So I'm opening to this psalm. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is a beautiful psalm. It's a pilgrim psalm. It's a pilgrim psalm. And it starts with, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And before we talk about this peace of Jerusalem, I, I wanted to turn to Isaiah. Isaiah mm -hmm. chapter 2. And... Uh, this passage in prophecy of Isaiah is written much later probably okay. than this psalm. We don't know really the dates of psalms, but listen to these words in Isaiah. Verse 2, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his path. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. Mm. Beautiful passage mm -hmm. from Isaiah. Yeah. When I was a young man in the 80s, there was a song by Paul Wilbur, a worship song, Come, yeah. Let Us Go. I mm -hmm. loved it. Maybe because back in the 80s, some of our church music was a bit slow. Mm -hmm. And this one, it was really yeah, like so upbeat, upbeat mm -hmm. that it was, Come, let mm -hmm. us go, let us worship. I'm going to play a little segment for okay. you to hear it. You, I don't know if you ever learned this, but I loved it. I know my kids loved it because it was frequently played. Mm -hmm. Come, so, let us go up. To the mountain of the Lord, and to the house of the God of Jacob. You can feel that happy music, right? Yeah, it makes you want to wiggle a little bit. The pilgrims are going with joy to worship. song just repeats again. So I'm going to pause it here, okay? But you get the point. Um, I love when the biblical passages are being put to melody. Mm -hmm. It brings a fresh perspective to what's happening here. Yeah, it's better than just reading on the plain page. There's other apps that where you can actually get tunes and scriptures actually to set to music, which is nice. But yeah, we're at uh, Psalm 122, Pray for the Peace of Jerusalem. And... Um, and it said, verse 1, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. So I want, I want to look at that just briefly and say, the response to being requested and to be directed to go to the house of the Lord, the response is gladness, not dreariness. I, I think about some, some parents have to drag their kids to church. They have to drag mm -hmm. their kids into worship. Not, not with this psalmist. 
And so, in essence, everybody should ask themselves, am I glad mm -hmm. when I'm invited to go to the house of the Lord? Yeah, exactly, yeah. And see, with this comes another perspective. We all want to live forever. Mm -hmm. And we want to be with God in heaven and paradise. Mm -hmm. But are we sure that we're going to be glad when we get there? Yeah. Because that gladness begins here. Mm -hmm. Am yeah. I glad to be with fellow believers? Because, you know, mm -hmm. with some people, you start talking about spiritual matters and you realize mm -hmm. they're not interested. Not interested, yeah. yeah. And so if they're not glad to talk about God mm -hmm. and His presence and His love and His nature and His mm -hmm. plan of salvation, mm -hmm. that is the most exciting thing to talk about, exactly. okay? Yeah. You, you can't stop me talking about this thing. Exactly. And so this gladness has to become part of our life. That's right, yeah. We have to actually enjoy these things. And I, I remember I was, I, was with, I was talking with an individual, an older woman, and um, she was relating to me like, oh, uh, what do you think? When we go to heaven, will we all be strumming on harps, singing Kumbaya? And I was like, oh, if that's your picture of heaven, that's really cynical. Mm -hmm. And that's that's not what it's about. I mean, sure, yes, we'll get to you know sing and play music, sure, but we're there to worship and to study beyond the ceaseless ages the things of heaven and the things of eternity, which is pretty cool. Right. Like you study the cross, you study salvation, and also the things of nature. There's going to be actually so much study, fun, as well as peace and security and safety. Yeah, yeah. So where's that gladness today? And and so notice <laughs> that here we have this instruction. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem, verse 6 of yeah. Psalm 122. May they prosper who love you. So it's a promise. Mm -hmm. Those who love Jerusalem yeah. will prosper. Peace be within your walls. Prosperity mm -hmm. within your palaces. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do we pray today for peace of Jerusalem? What's our mm -hmm. attitude toward Jerusalem? Mm -hmm. Or do we see it as a political entity. Remember when Trump was in power, it was yeah. a big deal that they moved U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv mm -hmm. to Jerusalem. It yeah. was like wow. a prophetic, uh, I don't know, fulfillment that mm -hmm. America has recognized Jerusalem as the capital. Mm -hmm. So what does it mean for us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem? What does it mean yeah, to you? So, so that's important. For me, I look at Jerusalem as the um, antitypical lady of Bible prophecy, the mm -hmm. God's church, God's people. And so when I see this, when we read this text, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, I see here, pray for the peace of God's people. Right? And I mean, that's, that's God's people, God's remnant church, God's uh, Sabbath-keeping people who keep the commandments and have the three angels' messages. And those who support these individuals, who support these people, are blessed when they pray and they seek the peace of Jerusalem. Well, some people say you're allegorizing and spiritualizing it mm. too much. Mm -hmm. Um, applying it for a particular yeah. denomination. Yeah. You know, uh, could mm -hmm. it be that the emphasis still should be somewhat to the earth of Jerusalem? Is it important for Jerusalem to remain? Mm -hmm. uh, notice mm -hmm. that throughout Christian history, the Crusades, for that matter, what mm -hmm. they're all about. Mm -hmm. Let's free yeah, Jerusalem. Let's get free Jerusalem right? yeah, and save it and keep it for ourselves. Right. Yeah. Even though in the process <laughs> so much evil was done atrocities mm -hmm. of killing the Jews in Jerusalem, mm -hmm. of killing anyone who did not think like the Frenchies and Anglos and mm -hmm. others who, who came under the Pope's banners mm -hmm. to Jerusalem, right? Mm -hmm. What does it mean to us, really, besides mm -hmm. the church? Mm -hmm. And you're right. Um, mm -hmm. The term Yerushalayim, and we mentioned this before, is a dual term. Mm -hmm. It means earthly Jerusalem and heavenly Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And when you read Hebrews um, description of chapter yeah. 12, it's obvious that it's an allegory for the church yeah. itself. Yeah, Jeremiah right. 6 verse 2, Ephesians chapter 5, it tells mm -hmm. us all that stuff, mm -hmm. right? And then uh, there's a point I want to see in verse 8 of actually of Psalm 122, it says, I will now say, peace be within thee, peace be within thee. And how can we have peace within God's people without the Prince of Peace in our hearts and in our lives? Mm -hmm. And uh, this is something I wanted to bring in there and just emphasize for us today. And, and notice, uh, he says, for the sake of my brethren mm -hmm. and companions yeah so focus is not so much on the city mm -hmm. but on those who dwell yeah. in the city on mm -hmm. the people mm -hmm. so when we pray for jerusalem we pray for the people mm -hmm. that inhabit mm -hmm. this place yes. that belongs to god mm -hmm. so yeah let's take a look at those who are born in zion um it says here in psalm 87 verse 5 and of zion it will be said this one and that one were born in her so you had the personification of a woman, right? And the Most High Himself shall establish her. So, in looking at Psalm 87, verses 1 through 3, we have um, 
uh, some text there to look at. If you look at Psalm 87, verses 1 through 3, which says here, His foundation is in the holy mountains. The Lord loveth the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. Glorious things are spoken of thee, O city of God, Selah. So in the past, he, God established the specific places where people were to gather for, to worship. Uh -huh. And so among those places was Shiloh, but it had been destroyed because of its wickedness. And after the temple was built, Zion encompassed Mount Moriah. No place could be better to teach the plan of redemption. Right? Therefore, glorious things have been said of you, O city of God, it says in Psalm 87, verse 3. So you had people being born here, you had people being established here and learning the plan of redemption. But notice identification of who are these people. Yeah. Verse 4, I will make mention of Rahab. Yeah. Remember who Rahab was, yeah, she right? Was, yeah, that, yeah. And Babylon, and Babylon to those who know me. Mm -hmm. So God is using these almost derogative terms. Mm -hmm. And then he says, but you belong here in Zion. Yeah. Behold, O Philistia and Tyre with Ethiopia, this one was born there. Mm -hmm. And out of Zion, it will be said, this one and that one were born in her. So it's mm -hmm. almost God is transplanting mm -hmm. all these nations to say, you also belong in Zion. Yeah, even though they're not there, but they, they belong there. They belong yeah. to be part, part no, of God's people. I wasn't born in this great country of Canada. I was born mm -hmm. in Ukraine. Yeah. And it's stamped in my passport, place of birth, mm -hmm. yeah, Ukraine. Ukraine. Yeah. Every time I cross the border and mm -hmm. I hand my passport, mm -hmm. I know it's there, yeah. kind of against me, that mm -hmm. I'm um, a citizen not by birth, mm -hmm. but by privilege, yeah. by the government granting me citizenship. Mm -hmm. And quite often they ask that question, where were you born? Mm -hmm. And so you respond, where were you born? But here, God is saying, even though you came from other places, mm -hmm. and you have maybe even dubious origin, mm -hmm but I will make you as if you were born here, here. in Zion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's that's an incredible picture. Mm -hmm, yeah. Because with this come all the benefits of heavenly citizenship, being mm -hmm. born in Zion. Yeah, and these passages are nice in context of like an eschatological sense where you look at the second angel's message, people being called out of Babylon and into God's people, being totally accepted and, and immersed into um, the religion. Um, I think about it in the sense of conversion and people coming in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And notice, Ben, we're emphasizing the spiritual aspect of Zion. Mm -hmm. Because as I promised our viewers, I will address the political aspect. There's a movement that was born at the end of 19th century. Uh -huh. Zionism. Zionism, yes. By Theodor Herzl, mm -hmm. a Hungarian Jew. Mm -hmm. He was an unbeliever. That's mm -hmm. known historically. Mm -hmm. They were so fed up with Jews being persecuted in Europe Mm -hmm. that they were hopeful, maybe if we escape Europe and go back to where we come from, back yeah. to our homeland, maybe. And, and so he started this whole movement. Mm -hmm. Now, I know there's been a lot of conspiracies about mm -hmm. it, and it, it's interesting, some of it not even conspiracy, it's just unknown facts. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you this little story. When I took my son Michael to Halifax mm -hmm. two years ago, it's almost three years already, we traveled and we drove, and once we settled him, I said, let's explore. Mm -hmm. And uh, when people ask you, where were you from? I said, we're from Windsor. Then I realized I had to correct myself, because there's a Windsor in Nova Scotia, just north of Halifax. Mm -hmm. And there's another place called Fort Edward. Mm -hmm. And so when we drove there, Fort Edward, near Windsor, it was the site where British were training mm -hmm. Jewish legions mm -hmm. so get this yeah. first world war mm -hmm. in europe yeah. long before state of israel is established yeah, already training british are recruiting mm -hmm. jews mm -hmm. from all over europe yeah. bring them to canada mm -hmm. to nova scotia mm -hmm. in halifax yeah. and they're training them for the future legion mm -hmm. that will go on mm -hmm. and do the conquering yeah. uh, one of those trainees was ben hurion mm -hmm. david ben hurion mm -hmm. who would become the um, father of the new Jewish nation. Mm -hmm. As you fly in Israel, the international airport in Tel Aviv is called Ben Hurion mm -hmm. Airport. And right there in that fort, they have big, beautiful pictures of this Jewish legion standing there on Yom Kippur with their prayer shawls and all that. Mm -hmm. So this is little known fact. It's not a conspiracy. My point is this. 
these people, many of the Zionists, mm -hmm. are not interested in God. Mm -hmm. They're not interested in resurrection or coming of the Messiah. Yeah, to just, them, Zion becomes yeah. just a political term. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. For other people, Zion could become a magical term, mm -hmm. which has none to do with these psalms because the intention of these psalms is a spiritual, a spiritual application, it's not application a and transformation. And that's mm -hmm. what we need to stay focused on, mm -hmm. the spiritual meaning of these psalms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Psalm 87 verse 7 says, as well, <clears throat> as well the singers as the players on instruments shall be there, all my springs are in thee. And it's interesting, all my springs are in thee. I don't know if you know the Hebrew in that one. I don't know if it's literally like springs. Does it mean, you know, music instruments my or something? My beginnings. Beginning, so the, the foundation, of the the fountain, the right, earth, right, the the, the yeah. issues of life. This is all my beginnings. Everything I, I will be and become. Mm -hmm. Whatever springs from from oh, the beginning, springs from the beginning. Is okay, got you. you. Yeah, all my springs are in thee, so the beginnings yeah. are there. Nice, nice. Mm -hmm. So as we're just looking at springing forth. Um, let's look at a, a, a sort of a, a water point here in Psalm 46, verse 4. It talks about the rivers and streams. It says, There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. That's verse 4. So here there's the use of a river, and the river has a source where it goes out. And it's a beautiful figure of God's protection. It represents a state of calm and security in sharp contrast with the wild ocean. Um, also, when you think of it, rivers are usually fresh water. And so you have something that's uh, conducive to life. You know, as you bring this up, it's mm. very interesting. You know, there is no river in Jerusalem. Mm. No. Yeah, in fact, yeah. River Jordan is quite a distance from Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had that vision and a promise that in the real New Jerusalem, mm -hmm. in a new temple, mm -hmm. there would be river coming out of the temple. Remember Ezekiel's mm -hmm. vision? Yeah, yeah. In Ezekiel's yeah. vision, river comes out yeah. of the city, yeah, out of the temple. Mm -hmm. In the book of Revelation, we have the same picture, mm -hmm. the river flowing from. Mm -hmm. And yes, river is the source of life. Mm -hmm. And so to um, enact that, mm -hmm. the priests would go downhill to Gihon, mm -hmm. and they would... Uh, pull out water mm -hmm. from the spring yeah. and they would carry water way up to the top and it's not just one priest there was a be a whole group of priests mm -hmm. bring these water buckets mm -hmm. up on top yeah. going to the temple mm -hmm. and then pouring water down steps of the temple mm. yeah. and it's in this I see it like the whole stream of life idea mm -hmm. right and it's mm -hmm. in this context in Gospel of John, chapter 7, mm -hmm. on the last day of the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. Mm -hmm. He who believes in me, as Scripture says, out of his heart will flow the rivers of living water. Yeah. And so picture that. This last great day of the feast right here, right? Mm -hmm. It's as the last feast. Yeah. Kind they of like come. Mm -hmm. And uh, they bringing ritual water to mm. pour down. Jesus is looking at this and says, if you're with me, mm. that water would flow from your hearts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And that water is the symbol of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. It's a promise of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And so when you read this Psalm 46, it's beautiful because it talks about this river of Holy Spirit that would make glad the city of God. Mm -hmm. Any more reflections on that psalm? I'm turning to mm -hmm. Ezekiel. I wanted to show that picture. Mm -hmm. uh, let's take a look at Ezekiel 47. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to start reading those few verses there because as he's describing this temple, by the way, many people speculate that maybe this temple needs to be built. Oh, is that, yeah. The third temple. Mm -hmm. Well, silly thing, you read about that. If they rebuild the temple, there's still no river in Jerusalem. No, no. So where's the water going to come from? Yeah. This is where we have to understand that a lot of these prophecies mm -hmm. are symbolic and they're pointing out to the fulfillment mm -hmm. in the book of Revelation. Yeah. Because that river literally is the Holy Spirit presence mm -hmm. in the new Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. You see? Yeah. Uh, read those so verses in uh, Ezekiel 47. Okay. 
Afterward, he brought me again unto the door of the house, and behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward. For the forefront of the house stood toward the east, and the waters came down from under the right side of the house at the south side of the altar. Then brought he me out of the way of the gate northward, and led me about the way without unto the utter gate by the way that looketh eastward. And so you have more and description more water as you keep comes, reading. Right. The water gets deeper yeah. and deeper yeah. and deeper, you see. Mm -hmm. And he's asking, son of man, have you seen this? Mm -hmm. You know, so this picture of future temple, mm -hmm. New Jerusalem, we have to understand, we're not talking about some earthly fulfillments here, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay? Because it brings this picture of river of spirit, spiritual river. Yeah, yeah, and it's to me, it's um, if you look at like the whole the temple uh, represents you and I. We know there's a temple in heaven, right? But we know the Holy Spirit's supposed to infill us too. You had Pentecost 1.0, we should have Pentecost 2.0, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So we should be filled with the Spirit. We should be as like vessels filled with water overflowing with the Spirit. Yeah, and mm -hmm. as we talk about it, this whole Psalm 46 is focusing on safety and peace mm -hmm. in Zion, yeah. in the New Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And look at verse 9. God makes wars cease to the end of the earth. Mm -hmm. God breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. God burns the chariot in the fire. It's extreme picture of pacifism here. Mm -hmm. With what is happening in Ukraine, man, mm -hmm. I wish God would just break those missiles flying. Yeah, know? like in the air, yeah. You see? Yeah. And God is able to do that. Mm -hmm. And so when we pray for peace of Jerusalem, we're not praying for certain nations to amount more weapons. We're praying mm -hmm. for God mm -hmm. to do this, mm -hmm. to break the weapons and cut them in two, mm -hmm. to destroy these tanks or chariots, whatever yeah. it is, to make war cease, mm -hmm. you see. Yeah. And notice again, God does it, but it's humanity that causes wickedness. Verse 6, mm -hmm. the nation's rage, yeah. you see. That rage comes from from wickedness. Yeah. But God is our refuge and strength. Mm -hmm. And that's the picture that we need to see always. So as we go into Psalm 125, we read about how there is the immovable Mount of Zion. And in Psalm 125, you have what's presented as a chiasm. So you have basically the structure that mm -hmm. lends itself to centralizing or sort of framing a central point of significance. Um, you'll see how each line will eventually match uh, match the next and have a central point in the center. Um, so actually, if you have your Bible out, you can actually mark it like A, B, C, C, B, A, like that. So the first point, point A, so Psalm 125 verse 1 says, Those who trust in God are immovable. So if we just stop there and then go to verse 5, it says, if we stop trusting, Psalm 125 verse 5 mentions that if we stop trusting, we'll be destroyed. So you have the same uh, idea, trust. Now go back up to Psalm 125, go to verse 2. The point there is that God is always doing good to his people. Then you go to verse 4, God is always doing good to his people. Same point. Now the middle point or the central point that remains is verse 3. It's like a sandwich. Verse 3 says, evil, basically evil will not always reign. So the point is don't stop trusting. Or, uh, yeah, always, always trust is the point. So mm. evil will not always reign, always trust. You know, as you uh, paraphrased okay. these verses, I want to reread them sure. in, in detail. Verse 3, that central verse of the mm -hmm. psalm, to which the chiasm points, as you said, mm -hmm. it frames it up. Yeah, like it brings sandwich, it to the pinnacle, sandwich. right? Yeah. The scepter of wickedness shall not rest on a land allotted to the righteous. Mm -hmm. I mean, just think about that. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of dispute who the land belongs to. Mm -hmm. If that land is allotted to the righteous, Bible says the scepter of wickedness will mm -hmm. not rest there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. God himself will remove that evil. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. And so then comes the promise, lest the righteous mm -hmm. reach out their hands to iniquity. So that's an interesting concept mm -hmm. because God doesn't want us to touch iniquity. No. And so that's why the iniquity has to be removed. If something is designated mm -hmm. for righteous, evil should not be present there. Mm -hmm. So righteous would not be spotted by it. That righteous would not be defiled by it. That concept, like that. Yeah. You see, 
Yeah, it's so it's conditional. I see in a sense too, right? Um, the the rod of wicked shall not rest upon the lot of the righteous, but then it's conditional, lest the righteous put forth their hands unto iniquity. Mm -hmm. So it's as if when you choose to go the wrong way, you choose to, you know, mingle with the wickedness, then you're inviting the presence of the of the enemy in mm -hmm. to uh, mess with the affairs. Of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Proverbs twenty two verse eight uh, says this here. It says, "He that sows iniquity shall reap vanity, and the rod of his anger shall not shall fail." Um, you know, we reap what we sow, and so if we do choose to depart from God and mingle with wickedness and choose that way, well, you're going to invite the enemy in, and he's going to have a mm -hmm. have a game, have a show. And so, as so we're looking at this, we touched only on a few psalms mm -hmm. and few usages of this term Zion. But there's much more of it mm -hmm. in the Bible. Even the next Psalm 126 mm -hmm. begins with, the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion. Mm -hmm. So this term Zion, we just want people to understand. Mm -hmm. It is a, a summation of God's bride. Mm -hmm. It's a summation of God's dwelling, of mm -hmm. God's presence, of his holy place. Mm -hmm. And uh, just like in the days of old when people lived in Jerusalem, mm -hmm. they found comfort of the mountains surrounding the city. Mm -hmm. And here this psalm also suggesting this, like mounts that cannot be moved, as the mounts surrounding Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people. Mm -hmm. One of the names of God was the God of the mountains, El Shaddai. Mm -hmm. And so... For us people, you've seen mountains. Mm -hmm. I'm sure yes, you've I traveled. Know. I've seen those, yeah. You recognize how small you are. Yeah, it makes you really take a hard look at yourself and yeah. say, I'm insignificant. <laughs> when I travel out west, British Columbia, Rockies, oh, yeah, beautiful mountains. Mountains too. Mm -hmm. And so when you recognize these mountains, for, for people in that day, they compared God with mm -hmm. those mountains mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because of that stability, security, confidence that he offered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, amen. So um, there's this one uh, quote that I want to share with you all as, uh, as we close up and round up the study. It's uh, from Ellen G. White. It comes from God's Amazing Grace, August 31st. It says here, she says, If the eye is single, if it is directed heavenward, the light of heaven will fill the soul, and earthly things will appear insignificant and uninviting. The purpose of the heart will be changed, and the admonition of Jesus will be heeded. Your thoughts will be fixed upon the great rewards of eternity. All your plans will be made in reference to the future and mortal life. Biblical religion will be woven into all your daily life. So let's have our eyes single to the glory of God. Let's direct our thoughts and our purposes heavenward and let God add to us everything we need in this world and this life. So let's live mm -hmm. every day as if we are in Zion. Yep. That's Amen. the essence of that mm -hmm. quotation. That's yeah. right. Yeah, that's right. So as we uh, move on here, we have our uh, mission, our weekly mission video, which is Hope for the Earthquake Survivors in Atakia. And that's Turkey. Yeah, right? Turkey. Yeah. It happened just, what, over a year ago? Yeah, February they... 2023. Yeah. But the work is ongoing mm -hmm. yes. because the relief needs more and more assistance there. Mm -hmm. That's right. right. Many people lost completely their house. Some people, they didn't lose completely, but they cannot return to the house. In one night, everything changed in Antakya. Much of the bustling biblical city of Antioch was reduced to rubble after a 7.8 magnitude earthquake hit southeast Turkey and Syria in February 2023. For devastating moments like these, the Adventist Development and Relief Agency, or ADRA, offer support to hurting communities. When you walk down the street of Antakya, what's left, you see that it's, everything's gone. From what I saw, I think 80% of the homes that are remaining are condemned. I think it was two days after the earthquake, we already received phone calls and emails and texts from ADRA saying, uh, how can we help? Adventist volunteers in Turkey were motivated to help. Just days after the earthquake, ADRA's experienced disaster response team worked with the volunteers to find the most effective ways to help earthquake victims. The team was stationed in Adana, the nearest city without excessive damage from the quake. Every day they packed bags with cleaning supplies, sanitary products, and food. 
The team then made the daily drive to Antakya, distributing the supplies to families living in tents next to the remains of their homes. They helped people like Ali, whose home had partially collapsed, but whose family had survived. He explained how blessed he felt, because directly next to his home was an apartment building that had fully collapsed, leaving only a few survivors. Even when experiencing great loss, the community in Antakya showed selflessness and hospitality. We wanted to help, and this man was uh, willing to help us. He said, I can tell you which families, how many families we have here. I can tell you where to, to bring, who are the most needed families. So we followed him and we were distributing 10 by 10, and his 10 was the last one. So he didn't put himself first to, to make sure that he was receiving. And then at the end, he insisted for us to sit down and have a, a, a tea time. All the time he was saying, thanks God, thanks God, our family is fine and uh, we, we have help and, and, and we, are, we are alive. Caring for others' needs in the midst of tragedy helps show the love of Jesus through humanitarian work. That's how you serve. That's how you're displaying um, the same methods that Christ used. You're, you're doing by working, and I think that's what he did as well. Right? I mean, he fed people, he cured people, uh, he took care of them, and that's what we're trying to do here. The positive impact the team made in Antakya wouldn't have been possible without the pastors and volunteers working together with ADRA. I think joining the church's ability to, to raise that volunteer base with ADRA's humanitarian expertise is, is just the most powerful thing. To date, we have reached over 7,000 people. No, I wish I had these volunteers on every, uh, every emergency response that, uh, that, we, that, that we take part in. I mean, they've been incredible. ADRA continues to work around the globe to alleviate suffering and show Jesus' love. Please pray for ADRA, as well as the remaining efforts to support those affected by the earthquakes in Turkey and Syria. Thank you for your support of Mission all around the world. Friends, we pray that as we do the recap of the lesson, as we do the short summary, it would prompt you to study more, to open your Bibles and to dig deeper in each one of these Psalms that we read. Let's pray that God would bless us, that as we dive in His Word, as His Word abides in us, that it would transform us. Gracious Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this short opportunity that we have to reflect on these eternal teachings of your greatness. Lord God, we're looking forward to when we would see you face to face, to when we would hear your voice not as sound of thunders, but in spiritual transformation, we'll be able to know and discern your voice. Lord God, we can't wait for that day when we would be together with you in heavenly Zion. Amen. Amen.